Uh, today is Friday, February 5. It's the end of week five in the Carleton academic calendar. It is nine degrees Fahrenheit outside. So I hope you all have a warm beverage to sip during our convocation, which we will begin in just five seconds. What is the power of symbolism and its role in cultural change? Welcome to the Convocations Program at Carleton College. I'm your host, Carrie Rott, Director of Events. I wanna thank the Carleton Office of Intercultural and International Life for sponsoring this Black History Month Convocation. Now we will be together for one hour and we'll include time for questions. You may click on that Q&A tab on your screen to submit your questions at any time. And I will present those to our uh, speaker at the conclusion of her talk today. Brie Newsom first garnered national attention when she tore down the Confederate flag in front of the South Carolina State House in 2015 in the name of social justice and equality. Following the brutal murder of nine black parishioners at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, Newsom climbed the flagpole and pulled down the battle flag as a protest against racist symbolism. Her arrest galvanized public opinion and led to the permanent removal of the flag. Driven by an unwavering belief in the power of the individual to make change, Newsom established herself as a touchstone of empowerment for disenfranchised people around the world and has become a recognized and celebrated voice on the topics of injustice and racial, racial discrimination. Also an accomplished filmmaker and musician, Newsom seamlessly blends her artistic talents with her passionate activism as she describes in cinematic detail the heroic gestures of ordinary people on the front lines of activism and demonstrates that ordinary people can make an extraordinary difference in transforming society. The title of her presentation is Tearing Hatred from the Sky. Welcome, Ms. Newsom. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It is um, really my pleasure to be here and address you. I can't imagine nine degrees right now. I am in Raleigh, North Carolina. That is a bit hard for me to conceive of right now. So I hope wherever you are, that you are staying warm right now. Um, I'm gonna pull up some slides to share with you for, for my presentation and I'll go ahead and get started. So it's very common right now to hear people describe the current times as unprecedented, right? Um, and in many ways, this is true. There's few, if any of us alive today with living memories of events similar to what we are witnessing now. We've got a once in a century pandemic, an economic crisis predicted to be the worst since the Great Depression, a resurgence of authoritarian governments and police states and a growing global threat to the ideas of human rights and democracy. But there are also many things about this era that are not unprecedented. This is not the first time people have had to unite for the common good and in the interest of public health. This is hardly the first time we've seen the government fail us or abandon us and we've found ourselves needing to rely on each other to care for each other, to build our own networks of support and mutual care. This is not the first time everyday people from all walks of life have had to summon courage in order to defeat oppressive regimes. This is not the first time we've had to fight for our rights. For me, it has been this recognition that I'm hardly among the first to struggle against injustice and oppression that has repeatedly given me the strength to do what I do. Just a few years ago, I never would have imagined myself becoming an activist or an organizer. And I certainly would not have imagined myself committing acts of civil disobedience or putting myself in a position to risk my life or be arrested in service to a cause. For me, it was the summer of 2013 that really marked a turning point in my life and set me on the course that I'm on today. 
It was during that summer that my family and I visited the old Slave Mart Museum in Charleston, South Carolina, a small building that was once part of a much larger complex than which enslaved Africans were once auctioned off. I stood there with my family and contemplated the unbearable thought of what it would mean to be taken out of that building to a place where I might never see my family again. Perhaps taken to a place like the plantation in Rembert, South Carolina, where my third great grandparents were enslaved on the eve of the Civil War, where according to my third great grandmother, Minerva Diggs, she prayed to God every night that her children would see freedom. That moment of standing in that place and feeling all of that history really gave me a deeper sense of connection to my family's past. The past seemed to be rising in the summer of 2013 and not in good ways. It was also in this year that the US Supreme Court invalidated key parts of the Voting Rights Act, permitting states in the South to change their election laws without advanced federal approval. My home state of North Carolina was one of the states that went to work right away, creating new laws clearly designed to make it harder for people to vote. Laws that made it clear why the Voting Rights Act was put in place in the first place. I was in Raleigh, North Carolina, the state capital in late July, when a friend invited me out to the Moral Monday protest responding to this attack on voting rights. Um, the Moral Monday protest, this was a series of a weekly marches organized by the North Carolina State Chapter of the NAACP. And every week, every Monday, they would march there to the Capitol and essentially stage a mass sit-in um, and refuse to leave. And so by this point, hundreds of people had been arrested. And what was so moving to me about the experience of attending that protest in particular was to see the number of young people and the number of students who had been participating in this protest because in addition to a clear attack on the voting rights of black people in the state, there was also a real concerted effort to attack the voting rights of students who had really emerged as a powerful voting bloc in our state. And so I was just so impressed by people taking this kind of stand, um, by people exercising this kind of courage. Um, and so I decided to join them in their next protest and we staged a sit-in that following Wednesday actually. Um, and the night before that sit-in, you know, as I was really considering what I was about to do and if it was really the right action for me to take, I thought about what it meant to have the rights and freedoms that I currently enjoy. I also considered how quickly those rights and freedoms could be taken away, how fragile it all was, how I had only had those rights to begin with because of the labor and sacrifices of so many who had come before me. The many people over the centuries who'd been arrested, imprisoned, or even killed because they took such a stance against unjust laws. Even after I was arrested at the sit-in and I found myself handcuffed in the back of a police wagon, and then later at the jail. It only made clearer for me how much courage had been exercised by those who'd come before me. I thought of the Freedom Riders being held at Parchman Prison where they couldn't have known for certain if they would even make it out alive. It made me realize all the more that I had no excuse to not take a stand in the current moment where the danger I faced wasn't nearly as great, but where everything people before me had sacrificed their lives for was at stake. Something else very key happened in the summer of 2013, and that was the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the murder of Trayvon Martin. A 17-year-old unarmed Black teenager walking in the neighborhood where he lived had been profiled, stalked, accosted, shot, and killed in an act of vigilante violence that's painfully familiar to African Americans. And his killer was arrested only after six weeks of intense national protest. Um, today actually happens to be Trayvon Martin's birthday and he would have been 26 years old today, I believe. You may have seen some people talking about that um, today. But for many of us, the case evoked visions of Emmett Till a 14-year-old African-American teenager from Chicago who was lynched while visiting family in Mississippi and whose racist killers were acquitted of their crimes. Like many, I was deeply disturbed by the facts and circumstances surrounding Trayvon's death. The case ended up sparking a new movement led by young people all across the country who saw themselves in Trayvon, 
One such group was the Dream Defenders. This was a group of Black and Latinx students who, after the verdict, staged a mass sit-in in the Florida State Capitol for several weeks. I ended up traveling down to Florida from North Carolina with a group of other young activists. And again, I was just so inspired by this energy that was building among young people in the country, people who were really finding their voice. Um, at the time, you know, it wasn't like we all looked at each other and said, this is the beginning of a movement, but that's what it ended up becoming because this kind of energy was happening all over the country. Um, you had the emergence of groups like Black Youth Project 100 in Chicago, Million Hoodies for Justice in New York City, and it would later come to be known as the Movement for Black Lives. And I was excited to be part of it and to be part of something that I recognized was so much greater than myself. And that was this calling to carry forward the banner for freedom, equality, and justice. We would later learn uh, a couple of years later that the Trayvon Martin case had not only inspired this new youth movement of people calling for freedom and justice, but also the young white supremacist who would go on to kill nine black people during a prayer meeting at Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. In fact, uh, in the aftermath of the killings among the writings that they found of Dylan Roofs, he wrote that the Trayvon Martin case was one of the things that had inspired his actions. Of course, the violence that we saw in Charleston in the summer of 2015 is not without precedent. Um, there's a long history of this kind of racist violence aimed at Black churches, specifically because of their historical role as being hubs of community organization. A lot of um, organizing around civil rights, of course, is tied to the church. And Dylan Roof targeted Emmanuel AME uh, in, there in Charleston, South Carolina, specifically with the awareness of that history and the, the awareness of that church in particular, which has a, a very long history of involvement, not just in the civil rights movement, but stretching all the way back to the abolitionist movement. He traveled to Charleston from Columbia, South Carolina, which is the state's capital, where since 1961, a Confederate flag had flown above the Capitol as a statement of white supremacist power and opposition to the civil rights movement. Um, of course, this is Black History Month. You may or may not be aware that February 1st uh, actually marks the anniversary of the beginning of the sit-in movements, uh, which began when uh, students from North Carolina A&T staged a sit-in at the Woolworths counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. And so when South Carolina first raised this flag in Columbia, it was largely in response to those sit-in protests. In fact, it came just months after a similar sit-in protest that was led by students in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Um, now being from the South, you know, I, my family is both from North Carolina and South Carolina. I grew up seeing this flag and there was never really any kind of confusion over you know, what it meant, what it represented, and why they chose to raise it over the Capitol at the time that they did. Um, I think it's important though, to really revisit what people said at the time. So you know, at the time that this flag was created, because a lot of the controversy right, over a symbol like the Confederate flag is people debating its, its meaning. And some people, of course, say it just simply represents the heritage or the history of the South. Um, so you can see here on the slide, these are, are two quotes um, from, from the uh, time of the Civil War. The first one is from William T. Thompson. He's actually one of the designers of what came to be known as the Confederate battle flag. And he is quoted as saying, as a people, we are fighting to maintain the heaven ordained supremacy of the white man over the inferior or colored race. Um, on the other side, you have Alexander Stevens. He was the vice president of the Confederacy, and he gave what is known as the cornerstone speech for this quote. He says, the Confederacy's foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. Um, and so those are the circumstances out of which the Confederate flag, you know, obviously first came into being. And then of course, after the Civil War was over and the Confederacy lost the war, it then took on a new life as a symbol of opposition to the Civil Rights Movement. And that's why you'll see a lot of images um, very much like this one 
where people may be protesting for civil rights and you have people who are standing in opposition waving the Confederate flag. And of course it also became a major symbol of hate groups, including the, the Ku Klux Klan. Um, we just saw very recently um, a month ago when the uh, insurgency happened there at the Capitol, you saw people carrying Confederate flags through the, the Capitol building. So it has a long history as, um, as a symbol for, for that. And like many Black families in the South, my own has experienced this history of violence and terrorism. Um, I have a great uncle who was actually lynched in Goldsboro, North Carolina. My grandmother, she was born in 1926 in Greenville, South Carolina, and she has shared with me firsthand, you know, her experience of witnessing the Ku Klux Klan drag her neighbor from his house and beat him in the middle of the street. And it's such a climate, it has been such a climate of terrorism that has gone on for so long that we haven't really talked about it often or openly, right? That has kind of been the, the climate. And the reality is that it is that history of terrorism, this understanding that if you push too much on trying to vote, if you push too much on trying to um, have equality that you could met, be met with violence, that made the Confederate flag there in South Carolina seemingly untouchable for so many years. Um, and it's important to understand as well, for people who perhaps are outside of that region, some people may not have become aware of the controversy over the Confederate flag in South Carolina until 2015 and the shootings. Um, but the reality is that it, it was a point of controversy for decades. So you had the NAACP was leading a boycott of the state uh, for, for several years. Um, and that's why, for instance, the NCAA didn't host championship games in the state of South Carolina, even though you have Clemson there, obviously, you know, very big um, athletics program, but you had a lot of businesses who were aligned with NAACP's boycott of the state. Um, and then in the year 2000, the um, legislature there in South Carolina agreed to move the flag from the dome of the Capitol where it was raised originally to the lawn, where it was at the time that I took it down. But at that point in time, they took further measures to protect the flag. So they wrote into the law that the flag couldn't be lowered for any reason unless there was a two thirds approval from the state house, which is, you know, that's almost like trying to get a constitutional amendment, very difficult um, to, to have two thirds of the legislature agree on anything. And so that's why when we got to 2015, we had this horrific situation where nine people were murdered in just this, you know, very blatant racist hate, uh, hate crime. And there was this horrific display of the United States flag and the state flag of South Carolina being lowered to half staff. But the South Carolina, I'm sorry, the Confederate flag was still at the top of the pole. Um, and I just personally remember at this point in time, I was an organizer in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it was just devastating. Um, Charlotte is just located an hour north of Columbia, South Carolina. So this is all kind of in the same region. You have a lot of people who live in Charlotte, work in Columbia, live in Columbia, work in Charlotte. So we're all kind of in the same area. Um, and it was, it was just so devastating because there was nothing really to indicate that that couldn't have happened where we were, right? It just happened to be that this was the church that got targeted. Where I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, we would have meetings at our local church all the time as well. And I remember just the day after the massacre happened, we had a vigil uh, at our church, just like many people were having around the country. And because at this point in time, I was you know, known locally as an activist and an organizer, I remember a reporter asking me, you know, what did I think the next steps were? And my honest answer was just that I didn't know, you know, um, it was so, it was so devastating. And it was shocking to think that it would take this level of terrorism, this level of, of hatred that we were still experiencing in 2015 to finally shake the nation's conscience around like, you know, why is a hate symbol like this even being displayed still? on a state house grounds. Um, and it's important to, to know too, like where this happened in the timeline of things. So I don't know if you all are as familiar with the Walter Scott case, but this case was in April of 2015. So this is coming just a couple of months before the shootings in Charleston. 
Um, and this case was significant. Obviously, we had had up to that point in time several high profile cases of um, unarmed Black people being killed by police. The Walter Scott case was particularly shocking, though, because this was one where it was the entire thing was caught on tape. So you had a bystander, somebody with a cell phone, just happened to catch this officer shooting Walter Scott in the back and then walking up to his body and planting evidence. And of course, people for some time at that point had already been chanting, you know, Black Lives Matter. This has kind of become the protest call. Um, but this was the first time you saw something like this, where it was like the cover of Time magazine, you know, Black Lives Matter, this time the charges murder because it was such a blatant case. Um, Clementa Pinckney, who was the pastor at Emanuel AME there in Charleston, South Carolina, was also a state senator. And just days before being killed in his church, he had succeeded in getting body camera legislation passed in largely in response to the Walter Scott case. Um, so they were just like layers, they were just, you know, layers of fact that just made this a particularly kind of like devastating uh, moment. And because Clementa Pinckney was a state senator, you know, he was given a state procession. This is where they were processing his casket through the streets uh, there in, in the Capitol in, in Columbia. And so if you can imagine this visual, this visual where his casket is being processed through the streets to the Capitol. Again, the United States flag is lowered to half staff, but the Confederate flag is still at the top of the pole, like symbolically flying above the uh, United States flag. And so of course, once the, these images started to come out as well of Dylan Roof, where he's burning the American flag, waving the Confederate flag, it led to this renewed focus on why South Carolina was continuing to endorse this hate symbol. Um, and so like I, I told you at this point in time, I was a local organizer in Charlotte. I really wasn't intending necessarily to get arrested again. I you know, had, had been arrested that first time for the sit-in protest in Raleigh. But this was a situation where I felt and, and having discussion with others um, around me we really felt like this was the type of situation that warranted a civil disobedience action. Um, and so we came together, uh, we talked about it. This was just about four days before I took the flag down, which was on a Saturday, June 27th, 2015. We came together about four days before that. And our first discussion was, do we wait on the, the state of South Carolina to do this or do we want to figure out a way to take the flag down ourselves? Um, and we decided that we wanted to take it down ourselves for a few reasons. Um, one was to really highlight the injustice uh, of the law that, that first had put this flag in place. Um, we also really wanted to draw a contrast between the violence that had occurred in Charleston um, and a demonstration of peaceful civil disobedience. So whereas Dylan Roof had gone into a church in the evening, murdered people and then run away here, would be someone taking the flag down in broad daylight in a very vulnerable position, really kind of demonstrating a defiance against the terrorism and the fear that it was intended to cause. Um, the reason that I ended up scaling the poll uh, was really because of the way that South Carolina had constructed the flag. So you can see in this image, uh, you can probably tell, they designed the flag to have an internal pulley system. So there was no rope on the outside. You couldn't simply walk up to the pole and lower the flag that way like you would on, on many flag poles. They also created it with this four foot tall spoked fence, which you can see is going around um, the pole there. So we knew that it was gonna take probably at least two rolls to get the flag down. One would require somebody to actually scale to the top and take the flag down, that's how that became the method, and then someone to help that person over the fence. Um, the first thing that we had to consider, of course, was who could physically scale the pole and also risk being arrested. And that narrowed it down to just um, you know, a few of us. There were a lot of things people had to consider. Um, and we felt that it would be very powerful to have this image of a black woman, of someone who was descended from people who were enslaved in South Carolina, taking the, the flag down. And so that's how that role ended up landing on me. Um, and then when we were considering who should be the person to help me over the fence, stand as I climb and get arrested alongside me, that's how that role ended up going to James. You can see here uh, him being arrested alongside me. Um, and we thought that that would be very powerful for James as a white man to be in that position so that we could demonstrate 
that dismantling racism, um, that ending these systems of oppression, it's not just the labor of the oppressed, but also people who have benefited from the oppression, right? That it, and, 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 and also acknowledging um, this long history of multiracial coalition, uh, particularly in the history of abolition and the history of um, civil rights. Um, and it was kind of with this, this awareness of history that we wanted to attack a symbol of systemic racism by creating a, a symbolic moment essentially that symbolized its dismantling. In 1963, I'm sure you're all familiar with King's letter from a Birmingham jail, which is, you know, uh, people reference it a lot because that's really where he explained the whole philosophy of nonviolent resistance. Um, and he described it as, uh, quote, being used to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. And that was exactly the aim with this action. So if we have a situation where the state of South Carolina is saying, oh, we can't, we can't lower the flag because of this law that we created ourselves, right? And we can't lower this flag that we raised at, uh, at the height of the civil rights movement when black people didn't even have the right to vote because of this law that we passed in 2000. Then what we do is we force a crisis by taking the flag down and then leaving it to the state of South Carolina to decide whether to leave it down or to raise it back up. And of course, they raised it back up in the immediate aftermath, but then public pressure built such over the next 10 days that they eventually took it down. Um, and like I, I told you, you know, we knew that it was going to require several roles. It wasn't just James and myself. Um, there was a whole team of us working together. I know some people think I just hopped up that morning and did it myself, but this was a very thought out, uh, deliberate action that required um, several people in it. You can see in this image where James is holding onto the pole. And the reason that he's doing that is because as I approached the top and was getting ready to unhook the flag, the officers at the bottom actually threatened to tase me. So there was a moment where they had three tasers trained on me. And of course, you know, if they were to actually shoot me full of electricity while I'm attached to a metal pole, it could have electrocuted me. Um, and so if you've seen any of the video, you might notice as I'm coming down, James is holding onto the pole the whole time. And he was basically saying like, if you electrocute her, you will have to electrocute me too. And then they de-escalated. Um, so James's presence was not only symbolic, but again, coming very much in the tradition of white accomplices, you know, standing side by side with black people um, in this fight to address systemic racism. Um, and so it, you know, for us, it was never just about a flag, right? And I know we're gonna talk some more about symbols and I, I really look forward to hearing some of your, your questions on this matter as well. Um, but for us, it was never just about the flat, the physical flag itself, but really about taking a stand against hatred and oppression in all of its forms, right? Um, I bring everything personally that I have to the cause of democracy and liberation. It's a conscious choice that I have made to devote a significant part of my life and my energy um, to this issue. And that's in part because I have examined what is at stake for me personally, you know, in this time. But I've also, again, really thought about the past. And I've asked myself, you know, where would we be today if it weren't for people who recognized what was at stake in the times in which they lived? Um, and then I also think about the future and I ask, you know, what am I doing with what I have, with whatever contributions I can make in this time um, to ensure that the rights that I enjoy don't go away, that they continue to exist for future generations. Um, and hopefully that things are better for future generations than they are today. You know, this is a time of, of turmoil, obviously. It's, it's a, a lot of uncertainty. Um, frequently, if you are watching the news, a lot of the messaging is, you know, it might invoke fear. People are experiencing a great deal of anxiety. I would say, though, that turmoil is not necessarily something that we have to fear, right? Um, turmoil can be an indication that the ground is ripe for sowing the seeds of social change. And I would argue that every period of awakening in human history has been marked by a certain kind of turmoil. And it's true 
that the darkest hour is right before dawn. So I embrace this actually as a time of transformation and promise. And I am really hoping that on the other side of this period of turmoil is a better day. You know, I really consider it a blessing to volunteer and organize at a grassroots level in my local community where I can see firsthand the kind of uh, cooperation and innovation and courage that springs to life whenever people work together for the betterment of all. I really do believe in the concept of service leadership um, and that leadership is really first and foremost about service for others as opposed to ego, right, or self or organizing around, um, you know, lifting your own self up, but really organizing around service for others. I think that is the most meaningful leadership you can engage in. It's very common in this modern movement to hear people talk about leaderful movement, and we really do believe that. Um, so it's not about a single, you know, charismatic leader, but really about how are we building a multitude of leaders? How is everyone recognizing the contributions that they can make? Uh, and I truly do believe that everyone has skills and talents and, and resources that are valuable to this effort. Uh, and it's really just a matter of asking yourself, what can I do where I am at? Um, I think sometimes people have a very narrow kind of idea of activism, right? So unless you are doing something that makes headlines or is written in the history books, uh, that somehow it doesn't qualify as activism. And it's really important to recognize that a movement is really many people doing many things in many places at once. And that's always been the case. Um, most of their names don't make the history books, right? But we would not be where we are were it not for their contributions. And while it is important to kind of recognize some of those you know, key moments or, or key turning points in history, um, it's just as important to recognize that a movement is made up of many people doing many things over an extended period of time. Um, I think that this recent public health crisis is a reminder of that or an example of that, right? So you have a situation where People, I'm sure, who, who did not consider themselves activists, they consider themselves to be healthcare professionals, and yet they're finding themselves advocating for, you know, equitable access to healthcare. They're advocating for access to PPE. Um, they're advocating on behalf of their patients, which really is a form of activism, whether they recognize it or not. Um, so, you know, everyone is not necessarily going to be in a position to be arrested either or, or protest in the streets necessarily, right? Um, just like when we came together as a group and we were discussing on how we were gonna take the flag down, we had to identify different roles and everyone couldn't be in the position of scaling the pole or you know, putting themselves at risk of being arrested. Um, and that's okay, you know, um, there, are many, there are many roles to play. It's just a matter of everyone asking themselves, what is at stake in these times and what can I do in, in where I am? Um, you know, this word resistance has become very popular, right? That's one of the buzzwords of this era. And I think it's really important that we not allow that to just be kind of, ca of a catchy slogan, but that we really understand what it means to resist oppression. Um, because the reality is that we still have a long fight ahead of us, right? Um, and I think that the recent attack that we witnessed on the Capitol is an example of that. So while, you know, on one side we are fighting for progress on reproductive justice and environmental justice and racial justice and gender justice and economic justice and all these issues, there is an, an opposition that is just as dedicated and determined to taking us all the way back. Um, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning how I got involved over the issue of voting rights. That was almost eight years ago at this point, and we are still very much um, in that struggle. We are still trying to get the Voting Rights Act reinstated. You know, we, we just came off of this amazing election in Georgia where people mobilized. We elected the first uh, black congressman or black senator from the state of Georgia, um, elected a Jewish man from the state of Georgia. I mean, that has never happened before. And in response to that, we have people now passing new legislation trying to make it even harder for people to vote. Um, so we have to, to, to recognize the long-term investment in this struggle, that it doesn't just happen once um, and that we, we can't simply take these things for granted. I think that's actually one of the 
ironically good things to actually come out of this era is that it has shown us the danger of taking anything for granted, right? Um, that we have to remain constantly vigilant, that democracy is something that has to be constantly exercised and protected. It's not something that we just gain one time and then we don't have to put any more work into um, protecting it. And recognizing that oppression is really an organized system, right? It's an organized system of people making decisions on a daily basis that result in discrimination against other people. And so in order to counter oppression, in order to dismantle oppression, it requires us also organizing ourselves, making decisions on a daily basis that change uh, this pattern of behavior, the laws and the social practices that allow oppression to continue. I also think it's very important that we not allow purpose to get lost in process. And what I mean by that is that sometimes we can get so caught in the how we do something that we lose sight of the why we're doing it, right? Um, I would almost uh, point to this current debate that's happening right now over like, how are we going to address poverty? How are we going to address the people who are, are struggling? Um, to, to, such a, to such an extent that we almost forget what we are addressing. Like there are people who are hungry right now. There are people who are uh, at risk of losing their housing right now. And the most important thing is that we address that immediate need and not get so bogged down you know, in the how of it. I really describe our overall situation as, as being fundament, fundamentally a question of humanity versus dehuman, dehumanization, excuse me, right? So how are we asking ourselves the question of what it means to be human? How are our systems and laws and social practices and ways of interacting with each other, how do we do that in such a way that really affirms our humanity and doesn't dehumanize each other? I really think that that is the most pressing question of the 21st century that we face. You know, I've been praised a lot for my courage uh, because of this action. And I want to say this, I'm not the first person to say it. I can only attest to it, right? But courage is not about the absence of fear, right? Um, even when I, you know, mentioned that times of turmoil doesn't mean that we have to be fearful, um, but it, it doesn't mean that we are completely without fear or without anxiety. Those are human reactions, right? Um, I face tremendous fear when I volunteered to scale the pole. It wasn't that I wasn't afraid or that I wasn't aware of the danger that came with what I was doing. It was simply that I recognized that there was something greater than my fear, right? It was that I recognized that there was something to believe in that was worth the risk, that was worth facing the fear. And that's what gave me the courage to do what I did. Um, it was recognizing that the measure of my humanity is linked to my ability to recognize the humanity of others. It was about recognizing the power of becoming part of something much greater than myself, which is, I believe, this universal struggle of humanity toward a society that is truly free and that truly recognizes the rights of all individuals. In terms of like where we go from here, I think again, it is just really important to understand that we are talking about systems and structures. You know, a lot of times when we discuss uh, discrimination or racism or oppression, um, sometimes people reduce it to interpersonal interactions, right? And people will say things like, well, I don't hate anyone, right? Um, but you don't have to hate someone personally to benefit from oppression. You don't have to hate someone personally to participate or perpetuate systems that uh, uphold oppression. So we really have to look at what, what are the laws, what are the systems, what are the structures, right? Um, things like healthcare, education, housing. This is how inequality is maintained on a daily basis. And that's really where we have to, to focus in. You know, again, back to the power of symbols. Symbols are, are very, very powerful. Uh, and that's why the action that we took in South Carolina resonated as it did. What I'm showing you here are some of the um, artistic interpretations that people made of the action in the aftermath, right? Um, and while symbols are very powerful, and if they weren't, we wouldn't see so much controversy over the display of these Confederate symbols. The reality, again, is that the symbols themselves don't make reality what it is, right? 
Um, and so what I constantly caution against is we don't want a situation where we simply remove all of the symbols, but then we don't do the deeper work of really changing the society, right? Um, one of the other criticisms that we will frequently get from people who are opposed to removing Confederate monuments is they say it's historical erasure. Well, first of all, you know, the Confederate monuments themselves represent historical erasure because they were really about rewriting the history of slavery, of really downplaying, you know, slavery as the central cause of the Civil War and trying to, to normalize that. Um, but beyond that, we don't want to erase history. We don't want to take the monuments down and then act like they were never there. We want to remove them and then have education around why, why it was there. Why was the flag on display in South Carolina for 54 years? Why was it raised in the 60s? You know, what led to it finally being taken down? And then beyond that, what do we do to make sure that we don't have uh, any more incidents like what we saw in Charleston? What do we do to make sure that the legacy of racism and Jim Crow doesn't continue continue into the next century. That's the harder, deeper work that we have to make sure that we do. So as we fight to preserve our freedoms, which are under relentless attack, and as we fight to expand those freedoms for future generations, we should keep constant remembrance of those who paved the way for us to be in this position today. They have provided us a blueprint and an example for how it's done. They've established a precedent that we should always remember, that how it is is not how it must always be, that we can dream a new world and then work to make it so, that the mighty and the powerful can be toppled by the disenfranchised and the dispossessed, that oppressive powers cannot and do not remain in place forever, especially when confronted by a determined collective of people working together in the interest of justice. Thank you so much. My pleasure to address you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we will turn to some uh, questions from our audience. Carlton College was home to Senator Wellstone, who was uh, named a champion of grassroots movements. Who do you see as current champions of grassroots movements and what are they doing well and where might they improve? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I personally am very focused on the housing movement right now, which I, um, I really think is one of the most powerful examples of grassroots movement right now because it is quite literally a collective of people who are facing uh, homelessness, um, people who are directly impacted by the issue, who have made this a forefront issue. Um, I got involved in it probably like near the end of 2016 because it, it had really become an issue um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I was living and organizing. Uh, we had like mass displacement, a lot of development, you know, Charlotte is going through this economic boom, but it was resulting in a situation where people couldn't afford rent anymore. And so um, we actually have like massive tent cities uh, popping up in Charlotte right now as well because of the lack of affordable housing. Um, and one of the things that was remarkable to me at that point in time was that nobody was talking about it. It was like this issue that was really impacting people, but it wasn't something that politicians were necessarily really talking about. And so I have witnessed and, and participated in seeing people through grassroots organizing force that to be a forefront issue to where, you know, when the new administration came into the White House, housing was one of the first things that they addressed, um, which I don't think would have happened had it not been for uh, the, the work of people on the ground. Um, so I think that just really kind of speaks to the potential that we all have uh, if we work, if you know, work together and organize ourselves to really set the agenda. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily have to wait for people who are empowered to say, this is an issue that matters, right? Um, we have the ability to force that issue. And it's been long, hard, uh, fought work and it's still not over. You know, we've been able to get some eviction moratoriums in place, but people still owe back rent. Uh, and so that's why I don't know if you have seen the calls for canceling rent because one of the concerns we have is that we still face a mass eviction crisis in this country if people don't get uh, um, rent relief. So, yeah. What advice would you give to young organizers? Um, so I would say if you are already organizing, you know, I'm assuming if you identify as an organizer and you are young, 
I think working with a collective is extremely important. Um, I think balance, and this is something I have had to learn myself, uh, is really is really important because we tend to burn out. You know, that's one of the major things that you find. A, a question I get probably more than any other question is what do I do for self-care? Um, because it is very easy to burn yourself out in this work. And I find that finding a solid collective of people that you can work with is very key because it will allow you to step back when you need to. You can also provide support you know, for others when they need to kind of step back and make sure that they maintain balance. Um, I also find that it helps me keep perspective um, because again, the problems that you're going up against, they can seem so enormous, you know, sometimes, and, and sometimes it can feel like, you know, I'm just a single individual, what difference am I possibly making? Working in a collective of people, it reminds you that you're not the only person doing the work. You didn't begin the work, you know, and you're not the only person doing it. You can take rest when you need to, the work will still be there, you know, when you get back. Um, I'm in that exact position myself right now. And I'm just like so grateful for the group of people that I'm working with. The fact that I can say, you know, I need to rest a little bit. And I know that there's this amazing group of people that are uh, carrying the work forward. So that would be my, my, um, my strongest recommendation to anybody who is organizing. How do you choose where to invest your energy? That's a great question. Um, for me, it's a, a couple different things. One, I think identifying what you are personally really passionate about, and that can be for a number of reasons. It might be that it is an issue that personally impacts you. You know, um, part of the reason why I got involved in the housing issue was because my grandmother and her neighborhood um, are among those that are under threat of displacement. Um, we have a real issue of elderly people being pushed out of their homes because you know they're, they're on a fixed income or low income and they can't afford the rising you know, tax values on their properties as, as the development is happening. So part of it was personal. Um, the other part of it as an organizer was identifying something that people cared about and I could build around. Um, so the other reason I really got involved in housing was because it was an issue that impacted so many different communities. And one of the goals that I had as an organizer was to build a strong coalition. I felt like we were very good at doing short-term kind of like, you know, coming together in response to a crisis, but we really needed to figure out how do we build long-term functioning coalitions that can set our own agenda, um, set our own political agenda and really like, you know, drive the conversation from that position. And so that's how I landed on housing because it was something that would bring people to the table. So, you know, I, I think something that's going to sustain you for passion and then also thinking just practically about you know, where, if you're doing like community organizing or organizing on your campus, what is something that is really impacting people that people would like to see addressed? There's so much focus right now on making changes at the federal level. Um, where do you see people making, uh, taking the opportunity to make changes on a state level? Oh, that's such a great question because, so I really believe that local and state organizing is essential. And I think a lot of times we, um, we almost like overlook or, or, or don't even recognize how much of what is impacting us is really set at the state and local level, right? Um, so again, with the, I'll just point back to like the housing issue that I've been working on. Um, we, housing was a crisis before the pandemic hit. Right. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, it just skyrocketed in terms of, of the crisis, because suddenly you had all of these people who had not been at threat of losing their homes who now were because of unemployment in the pandemic. So we really had to our only recourse um, really in the past year was to press at a state level. We had to really press on the governor to create um, an eviction moratorium across the state. We had to press on our Supreme Court justice here uh, in the state to uh, put a moratorium on eviction court. Um, so, so we really had, because of essentially like kind of the, the breakdown, I mean, that was happening at the federal level, the fact that we couldn't really get any response at the federal level really uh, forced us to focus in uh, on the state. Um, but I would really recommend everyone like pay attention because a lot of these things, whether it's, it's school or, uh, 
policing, housing, a lot of that policy is at the state and local level. You know, we're pushing for funding and other policies at the federal level, but even when the, the federal government allocates funds to your state, how those funds get distributed, you know, what other decisions are making, a lot of that is at the state level and a lot of times that is overlooked. So I, I definitely recommend people to, to focus in on local organizing. Given that that flags, uh, importance as a, as a symbol, um, someone who wants to know what has happened to that flag that you pulled down? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, they, you know, first raised it back up immediately after I took it down. And then because public pressure built as it did, they officially removed it. I think it was July 10th or so. So about two weeks after my action, they took the flag down permanently. Uh, and so, so that particular flag is gone. Um, and since that time, there has been, you know, some rolling effects. Uh, Mississippi has now agreed to change its flag. It, you know, originally had the Confederate flag as a part of its state flag. Um, Alabama was another state that had the Confederate flag on display on its state house grounds. They actually took their flag down right away when the shootings happened in Charleston. Um, the reason that you know, we had the whole controversy in South Carolina was because they were pointing to that law that they had passed in the year 2000. Um, but we have definitely seen, particularly with the, the issue of the Confederate flag, um, a real change on the policy front. We're still pushing for a lot of these Confederate monuments to be taken down. Like for instance, here in North Carolina, there's a Confederate monument in front of pretty much every county courthouse uh, across the state. So that's another uh, part of the effort that, that we are still, um, still fighting around, but at least the flag is, is now gone in South Carolina. You talked about uh, nonviolent protest and its effectiveness. Um, sometimes we see protests uh, becoming violent and how does, how does that change the power of the symbol of the protest when it becomes violent or when there's looting involved and that sort of uh, negative yeah, I mean, so frequently, you know, when we talk about like nonviolent civil disobedience of the kind that we did in South Carolina, that typically requires a lot of uh, a planning, right, and strategy. It's like very controlled, even when we were doing like the sit-ins in Raleigh, that typically requires a group of folks who have gone and we said it's going to be nonviolent and we're prepared to be arrested. When you have situations where there's like rioting um, or looting or other things like that, that is usually an explosive organic unplanned protest, right? Um, and we have often seen that occur where, quite frankly, a community is pushed to the edge, right? Um, it typically comes, uh, most often it comes in the aftermath of a, of a police killing. That's kind of always been the case. Uh, police kill someone and it, you know, it explodes in, in um, prolonged rioting. And of course, you know, folks like myself uh, and even Martin Luther King, you know, said how a uh, riot is the language of the unheard. I think if, if you want to prevent it getting to that point, there has to be some kind of accountability, right? There has to be some kind of addressing of, of the grievances. We had a, a, an uprising and rioting for several days um, in Charlotte, North Carolina in 2016 after a police killing. And it was the same kind of circumstances as everywhere else. You know, it's not just the one incident of police killing that sparks it. It's that that comes after several other incidents where people have been looking for justice, not getting justice, people feeling like nothing they do gets any kind of response, right? Um, and people are desperate. I think like when, especially when people start looting, it's because people feel like they are being denied, um, you know, equality, they are being denied economic, um, access. Um, and so I think like the best way to to address that or prevent it uh, is to take those measures where people don't feel so disempowered, you know, uh, um, prior to something like that happening. Civil disobedience can be misunderstood as um, doing nothing. Um, how is civil disobedience also involved in action, being active? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think that's one of the most misunderstood things about nonviolent civil disobedience is people take it as passivity. And it's actually about actively non-complying, right? So um, 
here in the case of the flag removal, right? South Carolina is saying we refuse to lower the flag. And so we go and we take the flag down, right? Um, in a way that is directly challenging the law. Uh, the state says you have to sit on the back of the bus and people actively violate the law by, you know, either sitting, uh, um, you know, in the front of the bus or refusing to take the bus until they bring the whole entire bus system to a standstill with the sit-ins, you know, it's like the, the, the lunch counter is segregated. You can't sit here. So people go in and they sit in direct violation of the law. So it's not, it's not about being passive. It is um, really about being confrontational. Well, I'm not sure why, but we seem to have lost our connection with uh, uh, Bree Newsom. So um, uh, let me uh, just say that this has been indeed inspiring and a challenging uh, message from uh, Ms. Newsom. And we certainly appreciate the time that she spent with us today. And we also appreciate uh, the time all of you have spent uh, listening and engaging with us in this important issue. And we hope that you will join us again next week when we will hear from Reverend Sharon Washington Risher, whose family members were among the victims of that brutal murder at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, so please join us as we continue that conversation again uh, next week. Until then, please be well and be kind. Thank you.